Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Wayne Callen, and you're listening to Attitude Magazine's weekly ADHD Experts audio broadcast. If you're a parent of a child with ADHD, learning disabilities, or autism spectrum disorder, you know how important accommodations and services are to your child's success. You also know how complex and at times downright difficult the process of acquiring those services can be. Many of us don't know the differences between IEPs and 504 plans. Lots of us need advice making sure that we are maximizing the plans we set up for our kids and making sure that the plans are being correctly implemented in the classroom. We all face those big challenges starting on the first day of school. Today's topic will be of great interest to you as it is to me. We will get an inside game plan that empowers us to use the right IEP 504 plan strategies for success at school. Today's webinar is brought to you by Play Attention, the only brain training system that combines advanced neurofeedback and cognitive training to effectively improve attention, behavior, and cognitive skills in children and adults with ADHD. To find out more about Play Attention, visit their website, www.playattention.com. Today, we're fortunate to have attorney Susan Yellen with us. Susan is the Director of Advocacy and College Counseling Services at the Yellen Center for Mind, Brain, and Education, an innovative learning support and diagnostic practice in New York City. She also co-authored the award-winning book, Life After High School, A Guide for Students with Disabilities and Their Families. Today, Susan will talk about everything parents need to know and do when it comes to your child's IEP and 504 plan, especially as the new year begins. Let me turn it over to Susan, and thanks again for being here. Good afternoon, good morning, depending on which coast you're on. I'm pleased to be here myself. I want to start with the understanding that as the new year gets started, many or most of you who have plans in place will have visited them back in the spring. That seems to be the typical season for start, for annual reviews of uh, IEPs and 504 plans, but I want to take a step back to make sure we're all starting in the same place. So if you're an expert and you really know everything about this, please bear with me for a few minutes. I think it's important for us to all be in the same place. Let's first look at the 504 plan. It's really Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and that's how old it is. Of all of the laws that impact students and provide them with accommodations and services, 504, as it's universally known, is the oldest. And what it is and how it was set up is very different from how other laws are set up. So let's start with 504. 504 was put in place to make sure there was no discrimination against people with disabilities who dealt with the government. So if you had a company, if you had an organization that did financial business with the U.S. government, 504 was started out as a way to make sure there was no discrimination. After 504, the IEP grows out of the law. The IEP, by the way, stands for Individual Educational Program. That comes from the IDEA which is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. That's a much later law. Its earlier incarnations started back in the 1980s, but it's really something that's been revised most recently in 1994. And what it is is a law that's specifically aimed at providing students who have one of a list of specific disabilities with services, accommodations, and supports. Now, the main difference between these two is that IDEA runs to the student. 
it's a right that if a student has one of these specific disabilities, and we'll talk in a minute about attention, that student can utilize the supports and services from IDEA wherever he or she goes to school. 504 only deals with organizations that do business with the government. Now, if you stop and think for a minute about m almost all private schools, they're private. They don't take tax dollars. And although some of them may have some financial funding from the federal government through things like lunch programs and such, the basic rule of thumb is that a 504 plan does not apply in a private school. So the first question that you need to ask yourself when you're thinking about whether your child may need help under some law because of attention or other difficulties is, is he in a private school or is she in a public school? And that will start your conversation. If your student is in a private school, you cannot use, and again, this is a generalization, but it's a pretty good one. You cannot use 504 services. You need to deal with the IDEA. Now, where does attention fall in all this? Attention is dealt with differently under these two laws. As I said, the IDEA from which the IEP, the Individualized Educational Program arises, is based upon specific lists of disabilities. There is, for example, specific learning disability. Um, emotional disability. There are orthopedic impairments for kids who are, aren't able to ambulate. But there's a catch-all section under the IDEA called OHI, that stands for Other Health Impaired. A student with attention problems will be served under that category. Now, you may say, my son has both attention and learning challenges. What do I do? Not a problem. The categories are like a lock to a door. You open the door through one category or another, and you're in the room where services are provided. So whether the school and, and you as a family decide together to get services for your child under the other health impaired or the specific learning disability, it's irrelevant. Once you're entitled to services under one category, you have services available to you in general. So all of your child's needs will be met. Now, 504 is very different. The language of 504, if you take the time to sit and read through it, something I've done so you don't have to, is very much akin to the Americans with Disabilities Act. It defines functions. There's no specific list of diagnoses. So a student who has a deficit of attention will definitely be considered as having a disability under Section 504. Traditionally, the way that this works is that if a student has a milder disability, let's say a student has an attention deficit, because of that needs to take his tests at a quiet place, maybe for an extended testing time, usually it's time and a half, but has no other learning difficulties, that student would generally be best served by a 504 plan. For reasons I'll go into later, most schools are more generous with their 504 plans than they are with the IEPs under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. However, let's take a the sibling of that same student, she's got attention difficulties, but she also has a significant reading challenge. And she needs reading supports and a resource room and specific reading instruction in addition to extended time on her tests and a quiet place to test. That student almost in every situation would be best served under the IDEA, having an IEP. It tends to fall out that way for reasons I'll explain later, some schools are reluctant to qualify students for IEPs, 
But just understand that there seems to be a continuum. There's no bright line, but there seems to be a continuum that students who have more significant challenges or challenges in numerous areas will better be served by an IEP. Students with milder challenges or challenges in a narrow array of areas, let's say just attention, better served by a 504. In either case, the process begins with an evaluation. You need to start by requesting an evaluation of your child in writing. That can either be done in, by going to the guidance counselor or the principal, but the times that the school has to conduct the evaluation begin to run when you consent to the student being evaluated in writing. Now, that can differ from place to place how that works because a 504 plan can be a very simple thing in some areas. It can be much more, can look much more like a, an IEP in other areas. Let's take a look at the next slide as we develop a little bit about how, because parents always say to me, well, he has a 504 plan. Should I get him an IEP? Let's take a look. First of all, remember that there is no 504 in private school. So if your child is attending a private school, again, there are very, very narrow exceptions, so we're not going to look at them now, then you can't even consider it. The child has no right to a 504 in a private school. Both of these ways of getting services are required to provide something called FAPE, which is the essence of all special education. And FAPE stands for Free Appropriate Public Education. So free means no cost to you, and appropriate doesn't mean perfect, doesn't mean excellent. One of my legal colleagues always said, well, appropriate is like a Chevy with four wheels and it runs. Um, what every parent wants for their child is a Jaguar or a Lexus or a Mercedes or whatever, fully loaded with all the bells and whistles. No school is required to provide that for our children, even though that's, of course, what we want. Now. Let's look at some of the, continue to look at some of the differences. First of all, if you're considering whether a 504 or an IEP is right for your child, know that there's no right to an IEE under Section 504. What's that, you say? Never heard of it. An IEE stands for, and I apologize for this alphabet soup of, of acronyms, they're all over this body of law, and I really hope I'm not confusing you, but an IEE is an independent educational evaluation. Under the IDEA, when you remember we're going to get your child evaluated, you tell the school that they have your consent to evaluate, the school does an evaluation, and you take a look at this report from the school and you say, this doesn't feel right, this doesn't sound right, this isn't my kid. You have the right to tell the school that you disagree with the evaluation and they must agree to pay for a private evaluation that you have the right to go out and arrange. Now, there are lots of restrictions on that from who can do the private evaluation to how much the school's willing to pay. There are logistical questions about who asks for it. I'm not going into that. That's complicated stuff. Just know that under the IDEA, you have the right to seek an independent paid evaluation. You do not have that right under 504. Likewise, as we were talking before, an IEP is often considered to have richer services. Now, why is that? Because schools get funding for IEP services. This Schools get federal funding for providing IEP services. It goes from the federal government to the state and down to the schools. There, in fact, are, is more than one funding stream. A bigger pot goes to public schools. If you have a child in a private school who, if you recall, can still get an IEP, 
There's a separate funding stream that goes to private schools. Kids in private schools do not get as many services or as extensive services as kids in public schools. They still get services, but they're different funding streams. So that an IEP will often provide more services. So as we talked about in the last slide, a student with more complex issues should generally be served under the IEP. A student with simpler issues generally served under a 504. Now, an IE, the law that gives us the IEP, the IDEA, mandates parental involvement. This is important. You are part of the team that reviews the evaluation. You are part of the team that makes up the program of instruction, that considers the services. You're sitting at the table with the teachers and the school psychologist and the administrators. And if you don't agree, you can say so. You may not get a vote. You may not get the final decision. It's a consensus process. But you're part of that team. By the way, there are procedures in place for appealing if you don't like the decisions of the team. 504 is a little different. How 504 is implemented differs from state to state. What the law says is that this, each state has to offer a procedure for dealing with the administration of 504 and that if they choose to put in the same rules as are in place in that state, for getting an IEP, that'll do just nicely. But they don't require states to do that. So the procedural sections of 504 are very sparse and they differ from state to state For and from place to place. For example, here in New York City, where my office is located, an IEP can go on for 10, 12 pages easily. A 504 plan is generally one sheet of paper. The documents that go into an evaluation of a here again in New York of, for an IEP can go to run to 20, 30, 40, 50 pages of all sorts of reports. For a 504 plan, your doctor fills out a one, sh one sheet of paper, says your, the child has been diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. This is how it manifests itself. This is what he needs. One sheet, maybe two, and that's it. So the the nature of the procedures that underlie these laws differ from place to place, so I can't always speak to them quite as specifically as I'd like to. One final thing before we move to the next slide. As I said, the states get funding to provide IEP services, but there's also an accountability factor. They need to answer to the federal government how many students are classified, that's the terminology, to get services under an IEP. Are there, you know, too many students, too many students of color, too many students from poor neighborhoods, too many boys, not enough girls, because they do tend to work out that way, so that there's somebody looking over the district's shoulder. And that's another reason why schools are sometimes reluctant, because these IEP services are never fully funded. And when, with the, providing those services or classifying a student for an IEP, they also have to do reporting to the government about how many students they're classifying. And this can get touchy sometimes if they're not doing a good job. Let's get practical for a moment and switch to the next slide. Let's assume that we've gotten our 504 plan or IEP. It's now late August, early September, depending on where you live and your child's going off to school. First of all, make sure the teacher, or if your child has multiple teachers, the teachers have a copy of the plan. There are federal privacy laws, specifically something called FERPA, the Federal Education and Records Privacy Act, which protects the privacy of educational records. Teachers and schools tend to take this law and completely misunderstand it. And there are actually schools that keep a copy of the IEP or the 504 plan in the office and don't share it. Well, it serves no purpose if it isn't shared. So the teacher needs to know that the child's entitled to an ex extended time on tests. The teacher needs to know that the student can test, must test in a quiet location. If you find out early on, and for a student who has significant issues for whom these plans are crucial, 
you must make sure that you learn whether or not the teachers have a copy of the plan at the first day or two of school, and if necessary, give them a copy yourself. Also, make an appointment early on in the year. It doesn't have to be the first day to go over the plan. Again, depending on the complexity of your child's issues, the how helpful the school tends to be, whether or not the teacher has a copy of the plan, these will all be, and how old your child is. For a young child with significant difficulties whose school has been a little bit tough to deal with, you better get yourself in there early on, maybe the first week, and say, look, Johnny has an IEP. He has attention difficulties and learning difficulties. I want to make sure you have a copy of the plan. Now, mind you, the teacher may have been at the meeting where this plan was established the previous spring, but not all the time. Sometimes the teacher would not be at that meeting for logistical reasons, or maybe the teacher is new, or maybe the previous year's teacher was there, but not the new teacher. So you need to know your child, know your school, and make certain the new teacher or teachers have access to this and that you've gone over the highlights with them. Now, sometimes the student will be having a 504 plan or an IEP that involves the school nurse. This would be the case where a student takes medication in school or has an allergy or a medical condition. And don't forget, I mean, as a parent, I can tell you that kids rarely have just one thing. So it may be that your child has an a attention difficulty but also has a peanut allergy, all of which would be dealt with on the same uh either an IEP or a 504. Um, so if there's a significant issue of medication or a medical condition, you need to get into that nurse early. Now, depending on, the, again, the age of your child, how sophisticated your child is, how well your child understands what's going on, you can actually find out from your child about implementation. And that can be very helpful. We'll talk a little bit more about it later on. But let's say, let's look at the next slide. Something else that comes up often, not just in the beginning of school, but certainly more in the beginning of school, is people move over the summer. It's a great time to move if you've got a school-aged child because you're not pulling him or her out of school. What happens? You've got this IEP or 504 plan. You work very hard to get it put together. How does that get dealt with when you've moved? Well, the IDEA is very specific about what happens. The 504 procedures really vary by state. So let's focus on the IDEA. Really simple. If you move within the district or you move up to a new school level, to middle school or to high school, there should be no change. The IEP remains exactly the same because the IEP is essentially an agreement between you and the district. If you move out of your district but within the same state, the new district can use the existing IEP or it can, can create a new one. And again, you're part of the team that does that, but no new evaluation is required. As you may know, evaluations are required annually under both laws, but they're not required and, and every, excuse me, a revisiting is required annually under both laws. A new evaluation is required every three years, but no new evaluation is required if you move within the same state. However, if you move to a different state, the new district should do a new evaluation and create a new IEP. But no matter where you move, the new district must provide comparable services until the new IEP is created or until a new evaluation is conducted and then the IEP is created. So depending on your circumstance, there's very specific rules. And if your new district refuses to provide comparable services from the get-go, they are in violation of the IDEA. And I would find a local attorney if you can't get them to move a little quicker, find a local attorney to assist you with this. Now, you've got an IEP or a 504, whether it's the beginning of the school year or later on, you know that you need to review these annually with the school. 
but it's between reviews. Let's say you had your annual review, as we talked about early on. It's very customary to have that in the spring. You came up with a great plan. It's now October and things aren't working. What do you do? Well, you don't necessarily need to have a meeting. Let's say, and I'm going to use a, a sort of a vanilla simple example. Let's say your child is receiving uh, speech and language support one time a week. And it's clear that's not enough. You need to move that speech and language support with the speech and language therapist to three times a week. You contact the head of your IEP team, who you will know from your IEP meeting. That she or he says, you know, I think that, that I've, heard, I've spoken to the speech therapist. I, the speech therapist thinks that's a good idea. We have room in the program. So let's make a, cha a written change to the IEP. We'll all sign off on it. We don't have to have any meeting. And now the IEP requirement is for three times a week. So it's really basically a written amendment if everyone is in agreement. However, let's say the district comes back using that same example of speech and language therapy and increase from one to three times a week and says, no, we really can't do that. You as the parent have the right to convene an IEP meeting any time you wish. The fact that it's not, your year isn't up yet is not a reason to not have the meeting. You contact the head of your IEP team. If you don't know who that is, you contact the guidance counselor and you say, I need to, I asked to have a change made. The school wasn't willing to make the change. I need an IEP meeting convened as soon as possible. They have a reasonable time to set this up. And at the meeting, you're going to make your case. And perhaps you would bring in an updated um, statement from an outside speech and language pathologist. But the fact remains that you have the time to make, to convene a new meeting at any time. That's your right as a parent. Let's take a look at what happens at the beginning of the school year. We spoke a little bit about this before. But it's such a topsy-turvy time, especially for young children or children who are switching schools. First thing you need to do to make sure services start promptly is to make sure, as we said, that everybody has a copy of the IEP or 504. And we talked about how you can do that. Crucial, crucial, crucial is the nurse. Because, you know, you can wait a few days on get, making sure that a teacher knows something. But if there's a medical condition, the nurse has to be informed before the child walks into school that first day. Very important. Now, as a practical matter, again, people are, the school makes every effort to have all their staff in place, but sometimes they have problems with logistics themselves. Someone goes out on maternity leave. Somebody quits at the last minute. They thought they had a position filled, but they didn't. So it's possible that it's going to take a couple of weeks to begin some of these services that your child's entitled to. But if, let's say, two weeks go by, I would say that's a, a lot of time to give them. And there is no service for something like speech, occupational therapy, physical therapy, or resource room. That's a denial of your child's right to a free, appropriate public education, FAPE. They've got an IEP or a 504 plan that says that they need these things. They're not getting them. That's a denial of their right. And I would get back to the head of the IEP team, tell them that you cannot wait any longer and you are going to seek legal recourse. Oh, they love that. You're going to file for a hearing if this doesn't get put in place. They can't use as an excuse that they are having trouble with staffing. That's not your problem. Now, I mean, sometimes we have to be understanding and we, you know, a little bit of back and forth. But basically, there are situations where schools just can't manage the services. And because of that, your child loses out. And that's not fair, appropriate, and not something you should accept. How does my high school student get accommodations on the SAT or ACT exam? Easy one is the SAT because they have a program Cool. Well, their, their program for students with disabilities of any kind is SSD, Services for Students with Disabilities. 
Most public high schools and some private high schools have something called an SSD coordinator. That's basically usually the head of guidance or a senior guidance counselor who arranges accommodations for the student. So first thing you need to check is with your uh, guidance office, is your school have an SSD coordinator? If so, talk to that individual. They will have the forms. They will guide you. If you are regularly getting accommodations in high school and using them, it will not be very difficult to get them on the SATs. The people who have trouble are people who are, let's say, diagnosed with attention deficit in 10th grade and they go to take an SAT exam in the 11th grade. Schools, are, uh, the SAT folks are suspicious. By the way, they are guided by the Americans with Disabilities Act, which has nothing to do with the IDEA, looks a little bit like some sections of 504, but it's, it's a different set of rules. They only need to provide reasonable accommodations. Make sure the ACTs do not have as rich a structure for this. They are not set up in the same way as the college board SAT people to have these coordinators in school. But still, go two places. Start with your guidance counselor and then go on to the website. And both, actually, you should go on to the um, SAT website, the section for students with disabilities as well. Those websites have the most up-to-date instructions. They will tell you exactly what kind of a documentation you need to have. But as I said, if you've had, let's say you've had extra time on exams since third grade. It's now 11th grade. That's pretty good in terms of expecting that you will have sufficient documentation of the disability to get the extended time you need. Now, if they, SAT folks say it takes about seven weeks to get a decision on a disability accommodation. I would allow it much more time than that because you may need to appeal, and there is an appeals process. So as soon as you know what exams you're taking, and don't forget you might be taking a AP exam or something else. They're all governed by the college board. Um, apply as early as possible. Give yourself as much time as possible. One final slide before we start getting to the questions is bullying. And the reason I, I included this is because there's a lot of new discussion about bullying. Look, bullying is bad no matter what reason or who's doing it and what kind of child is being bullied. But there are special issues when a child is with a disability is being bullied. So the first thing that a parent needs to do is to make sure that the school, not just the teacher, but the levels higher up, is aware of the situation and to document it. Make a, keep a notebook. Uh, keep a record of any notes home from school. Keep a, if your child receives a nasty note, keep it. But a bullying which is based on disability can be considered a denial of the free appropriate public education to which your child is, is entitled or can actually be a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. You have to look at the bullying to see is it related to the disability. If a kid is has some sort, let's say a child has a visible, uh, I'm going to use an extreme example, a child is in a wheelchair and someone makes fun of that but not just once, but on a persistent and bullying basis. Well, that's clearly bullying based on the student's disability. And if this is persistent and the school is not addressing it immediately and effectively, go onto the website for the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. They have some good documents and you can actually file a federal complaint. It's not the ideal way to do this. Obviously, it would be best if the school handled it. But I just want to raise parents' awareness that when a student with a disability is bullied, it's not simply a disciplinary issue, but it's actually a denial of what they're entitled to as far as their education goes. So we've dashed through a lot of information. I'm hoping that there are a few questions out there that we can address. There are lots of them. So I'll begin with one that has been asked in various forms. Uh, 
I asked my son if the teacher was giving him a quiet place to take tests, something that is in his 504 plan. He said no, which got me wondering if the other accommodations in his plan are being implemented. How should I best handle it? Well, the first thing to do is go back to your son, again, depending on your son's age and sophistication, and go through the list of accommodations. So even a young child will be able to tell you, Johnny, does the teacher give you extra time when everybody's taking a test? I mean, those sorts of things. Try to figure out as best as you can what is being done and what is not being done. So you now have a list of likely areas of problem. Then your next step is to meet with the teacher. Why not? Maybe the teacher doesn't have the 504 plan. I mean, some of these things we just talked about. Maybe the teacher doesn't understand that it's not a suggestion. It's a legal document. you got to tread carefully. I know nobody wants to get into conflict with their kid's teacher, but sometimes a preliminary conversation can fix this. If that's clearly not happening, then the next step is to the head of the IEP team who you should, excuse me, the 504 team. Every school has one, even if you're in a district that kind of does 504 without a lot of parental involvement. You can find out from the guidance counselor or the principal or by looking at the document and seeing who signed off on it. You set up a meeting with the head of the 504 team and say this 504 plan is not being implemented. I need it to be implemented or it's going to be necessary for me to take it to the next legal step. Mm -hmm. So, I, would, I mean, I start with the student, get as much, do a little cross-examination, as my kids call it, um, then meet quietly and calmly with the teacher and then jump right to the head of the team and f explain that it needs to be implemented and that you will take legal steps if it's not. Again, sweetly, nicely. You have to, with all of these things, and, you know, it, it differs from school to school. An IEP or a 504 plan is not a request. It is a binding, legally enforceable document that sets out the rights under federal law that a student has. Don't take any nonsense from them. You know, most people want to do the right thing and may not know what it is. But every once in a while, I get somebody who thinks it's up to them. It's not. Next question. <laughs> uh, this mom, uh, her son attends public school. He was evaluated. The evaluators came back with child does not need services. But the mom disagrees. What can she do? The mom should advise the school that she intends to seek an I. E -E, that we were talking about that early on, an independent educational evaluation. Google the term, take a look at it. You can also, um, our website, which I think you guys have, it's yellencenter.com, has a blog. I write all the legal blogs. We have like 800 of them. And look up IEE -E under the search term there. You can take a look and see a lot of information about how you can get an independent educational evaluation. Basically, the school has to give it to you unless they proceed to a hearing to defend their obligation and, and say and can prove that they don't have to give it to you. It's, it's a right that you have. Get an independent evaluator and let's see what's really going on. Mm -hmm. uh, this mom asks about her son who is in fourth grade. He isn't doing well, she says, because of his behavioral problems. He gets out of his seat when he shouldn't, talks with friends right in the middle of a lecture. Can I work with the school to develop a behavioral plan along the lines of an IEP for academic services? Absolutely. IEPs are not just for behavioral services. So what your school needs, to, what you need to do is seek an evaluation. I would start out by seeking an evaluation. This, I assume, let's, let's operate on the assumption that it's affecting his academics. So yes. let's, and let's operate on the assumption that perhaps there is an attention issue here. What you want, schools are obliged to evaluate in all suspected areas of disability. And they're not simply looking at academics, but behavior is part of that. So for this particular student, an appropriate evaluation would include an evaluation of behavior. 
and an appropriate IEP would include a behavior modification plan. That's very customary. It will not come as news to anybody at the school. So the first thing that this mom needs to do is to seek to have the student evaluated with a focus on the behaviors that are going on. And they need to do a behavioral evaluation. But it's definitely an appropriate part of an IEP. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How long does it take to actually implement an IEP or 504 plan in the classroom? This mom says, I set it up back in spring, so now the school year is about to begin. When should I expect services to actually start in the new school we year? We had talked about that. In fact, one of the slides was about that. When can I make sure that services begin? Um, Classroom-level services, things like preferential seating, uh, extended time for testing, things that, are, that can happen in the classroom, the teacher should hand the student um, a written copy of all instructions and assignments as well as putting it on the board. These are not uncommon things in an IEP. That should be in place from day one. And if it's not, you should be there in the morning of day two. But some of the out-of-classroom services or specialist services that require faculty to be in place and schedules to be set up can take a week or two. But if it's taking a lot longer than that, you need to go back to your team leader and let them know that they're in violation of your child's IEP or 504 plan. Okay. But realistically, then, you would expect in the first... I would say, I yeah. would say un, it, only the really together schools are going to start <laughs> these things. Look, an experienced teacher who knows what's going on will put her, his or her piece together the first week. Mm -hmm. A really together school will have the outside staffers, let's say the speech and, and language person and the resource room person, by the beginning of the second week. If by the end of the second week things are not happening, then you need to go back and speak up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Michael has a question. Uh, he says, we are meeting great resistance from the school administration to our request for a 504 plan for our son who has ADHD and OCD. The main rationale we are being given is that his academic performance meets district standards. What can we do or say to convince his school that he needs a 504 plan despite his academic success? A 504 plan, it's a great question because it raises something that we didn't talk about, which is a lot of schools are resistant. They shouldn't be. A student can have a disability, need an IEP, which is generally richer, but the, and they balk because the student's doing well. But a 504 plan has nothing to do with academic performance. It's a right of a student with a disability. And I would actually go online and look up the language. It's, I think, Section B of, of Section 504. And I have to tell you that the entitlement of the student to accommodations and services under 504 should have nothing to do with their academics. If the parent cannot convince the school of that, go to, um, there are a number of websites that have the names of good local special education attorneys, it might be worth a conversation. Mm -hmm. But the school is incorrect. Mm -hmm. They cannot deprive that student of the supports and accommodations because he's doing well in school. It's like punishing a kid for being a good student. Right. Not fair. Not right. Yeah, a dad asks, in, in an IEP meeting I attended for my daughter, the team had a whole different set of services they recommended that were different than the ones I thought would really work best for her. They didn't really listen much to my suggestions. How do I get their attention? You can get their attention by using, well, at the meeting, you could have gotten their attention by using these special magic words, which I am now sharing with all of you. I'd really hate to have to take this to a hearing. The magical part is to take this to a hearing. A hearing is basically an appeal from the decision of the IEP team. It's a swift pain for everybody involved, but the school doesn't want it either. And it's absolutely your right. Now, that's also showing that what you have is, I mean, let's assume that they're basing their decision in terms of what the student wants 
Not on giving the student less, but on giving the student different. It may be that there's something right about it. There may be that they're completely wrong. If that, I, if that meeting was held, let's say, in May with a view towards this year, I might do the following. I might start out the school year, if you can tolerate it, seeing how it goes for, let's say, a month to six weeks, no longer. If their stuff is working or part of their stuff is working, fine. But if it's not working, if you recall, I talked about how you can either convene another meeting or get an agreement in writing to modify the IEP. So this might be, now that the meeting is done, and we're not at the meeting where you can put your foot down and demand a hearing and, and all sorts of other unpleasant things, I think that the real thing to do right now is possibly to see what, how it goes with these new, with the school's suggested plan. If you feel it's so grossly inadequate, then just call another meeting and sit down and perhaps bring somebody with you to help you speak up and speak, you know, speak to these problems. It may be that you need another evaluation, or, uh, independent evaluation. But I don't have enough information on why the school came out with a different set of plans than you did. It's hard to know. Yeah, your, your answer is very good. Um, uh, a dad asks, uh, should I hire an education advocate to attend the first IEP meeting? What are the pros and cons of having such an advocate in the room? Interesting, excellent question. First of all, I don't know that you necessarily need an advocate. Now, I'm going to come at this with a particular perspective. I definitely wouldn't bring an attorney because then the school is going to want to adjourn the meeting and bring their own attorney. And it's, it's like bringing a, you know, a gun to a knife fight, I think is the expression. You don't want to bring an attorney. Advocates range in their qualifications. Anyone can hang out a shingle and say they're an educational advocate. Some of them are superb. Some of them need more experience. So it really depends in part on who. You can bring anybody you want to an IEP meeting. I definitely recommend you bring a trusted friend or your spouse or um, your sister-in-law, somebody to take notes. I also recommend that you bring somebody who can kick you under the table if you get a little agitated. Um, <laughs> you know, you got to maintain your cool. Mm -hmm. But I think most parents can do a little homework on their own. There are a lot of books out there that talk about what your rights are. It's not that difficult to get a sense, and you certainly know your child. I, and since you can reconvene a meeting at a later point, since you could appeal from the findings of an IEP meeting, I'm, my thoughts are you might want to do this. You might want, if you feel that there's going to be a problem, you might want to have a consultation with a special education attorney in your area. Not to bring that individual to the meeting, but to get a sense of what you can expect it you know, depends on what you're asking for. If you're asking for, again, I'll be keep using that same example, speech and language services, that's one thing. If you're asking to have the school send your child to a private school for specialized services, well, that's a big ask, and you may need some guidance. So you may want to have a preliminary meeting with a special ed attorney who knows the district, who knows the players, and then go in yourself, do what you can to make it work, and see how it goes. And I know a lot of people who will bring an advocate, and that can be very effective as well. I'm not speaking against advocates. I just don't think it's necessary in all situations. Mm -hmm. uh, this mom has a child with an IEP in private school, and the son is moving to public school. What obligations does the public school district have to continue accommodations and also perform evaluations? So this is sort of... well. Yeah. The student will have really what's called an IESP, an Individual Educational Services Plan. That's what it becomes in a private school. She can generally expect richer services in a public school. As I said, there were two funding streams and a bigger funding stream in, private, in public schools. So what she should do is immediately before school starts 
is meet with the guidance office in the public school, explain just what she told us, that she's the student has an IEP, is now transferring. The school is obliged to provide at least comparable services until they can convene an IEP meeting, and they should do that promptly. And depending on when his last evaluation was, they may need to do another evaluation and set up a new IEP that will provide the student with what he needs. So it's, a, it's not a complicated process. It's up to her to let the school know. The school does have something which is called a child find obligation. It's the school's responsibility to know who is in their district has need of special education services. Depends on where, this gets really complicated, but just very briefly, depends on where the private school was, what district, as a, opposed to where the public school is, because services are provided in the district in which the school is located. So if the parents live in a district, and that's where the student will be going into public school, but the private school was in a different district, it can get complicated. Mm -hmm. It's complicated, clearly. Uh Angela asks, my son has a 504. I have been requesting an evaluation from the IEP team since March. Still no evaluation. What else to do? What she should do is get back to them in writing and say, now I assume that there was no evaluation done for this 504 because mm -hmm. it may be that he was evaluated in a general way, and they said, well, what he needs is a 504. They don't have to do a new evaluation if he was evaluated. I'm assuming that they just gave him a 504 on a doctor's note, let's say, and that he was not evaluated. If there was no evaluation done within the last three years, then what she needs to do is put in a written request for an evaluation. The district is obliged to provide the evaluation and if not, she should speak to a local attorney and consider what her next step should be. She mm -hmm. shouldn't sit back and wait. Mm -hmm. uh, this mom, their child received a new diagnosis for ODD in addition to his ADHD, for which the 504 plan he has was put in place. How do we update to include accommodations for his ODD? What she needs to do is to contact the head of the 504 team, and if she she should be able to get that information off of the current 504 plan or check with the guidance counselor, mm -hmm. um, at which point they should convene another 504 team meeting. If in her state parents are involved, that's great. Some states include parents, some states don't. And if she feels that the 504 services are not rich enough, then she may wish to request an IEP based on the fact that the child would now fall within, clearly fall within other health impaired. Mm -hmm. So that's a possibility too. But definitely start with the head of the um, 504 team, explain that circumstances have changed. It's necessary to update. Uh, I know you've already mentioned this, but a as a first step, a lot of parents have asked this, and it might have gone by them. It went by me very quickly. My son was diagnosed with ADHD in January. He doesn't have an IEP or 504 yet. What is the very first step I should take to get what my son needs? I just thought it might be worth repeating. Okay. The very first step is to... Go to the guidance counselor or the principal. Some schools are so tiny they don't even have their own guidance counselors. And in writing, tell them that your child has been diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, that you believe that your child requires a 504 plan, that you wish to get the process started. What form do you fill out? And again, it's different from place to place. And do not leave without filling out that form and returning it. Okay, that's a good action point. What steps should you take for a child with an IEP when the district tells you our district does not have that service, so they won't address his need? Is that there is, ever a time? Go ahead. Sorry. That's not, I hear it all the time. That's not acceptable. If the district does not have the service, and the parent believes the child needs the service, then the parent needs to seek legal guidance 
to force the district to provide the service. Now, it can be provided in a lot of different ways. The district can hire new staff. The district can fund the parent getting it privately. Perhaps if the district... If the district is not providing the child with an appropriate education, the parent may actually have the right to put the child in a approved private school. I'm not even getting into what's approved and what's not approved here. It's a long answer. Um, at the expense of the district, if the district can't provide the child with what he needs. So it opens up a whole can of worms. I would go, what I would do is go back to the head of the IEP team and say, I've done some research and I understand that the fact that you don't offer the service is not a sufficient excuse for not providing it. Let's discuss how you're going to provide the service so I do not have to bring my attorney into this matter. That should mm -hmm. get a move. <laughs> well, I, I think we've run out of time, unfortunately. Now, uh, there are a lot of questions we didn't get to. Do you have a suggestion on where people might be able to ask them at either on your website yeah. or a couple of different ways to get them answered. One is, as I said, our website has a blog with a search feature and we write about all sorts of things, but there's a whole lot of legal subjects that are covered. The blog is located at www.yellincenter and my name is right up here. Y E L L I N Yellen center, C E N T E R.com. And at the top, of the navigation, you could look up blog. So it's yellencenter.com and look up the blog. And then there's actually a search feature. You can search IEP 504. There's a list of the topics. There's like 800 blogs there. So there probably is something that addresses your concern. Secondly, you can send me an email. Send it to info, I-N-F-O, at yellencenter.com. And in the reference line, put question for Susan Yellen. It depends on how many I get. I've done these webinars before, and sometimes I get inundated, and sometimes it's not so much. So I will get to them as soon as I can. But just in the reference line, do question for Susan Yellen so that the folks who get these in will know where to send it. You know, it's complicated stuff. Don't get overwhelmed with it. Just one step at a time, and we'll all get there. That's very good. Uh, I wanted to thank you again for your insight strategies and, and especially the practical information you provided. Action points, that's what parents really want on this topic and you provided them. So thanks again for coming and thanks again to our webinar sponsor, Play Attention. We're grateful to all of you for listening in and thanks again, Susan. Bye-bye now. Bye. For more Attitude Podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com. 